Thank you everybody for coming to today's workshop. Uh, we're going to be discussing reasonable accommodations for students with disabilities. For those who don't know who I am, I'm Christine Maselli. I'm the Disability Services Counselor here on the Eastern Campus. Um, and today we're really going to try to do a few things. We're going to try to first define what a disability is. Um, define the law behind the, why we need to provide accommodations at the college level, um, explain what reasonable accommodations really should be, and then break down those accommodations to uh, student responsibility, professor responsibility, and then the responsibility of the Disability Services Office. Um, so if we get started, um, as I said, with the, the d definition of a disability, so it's going to be a physical or mental impairment that's going to substantially limit one or more um, lifetime activities, life activities um, for, for the individual. So that could be school, um, that could be, you know, that, that could be work, things like that that may be affected. Um, also, it's, there should be a record of such impairment, so I'll go into this a little bit further, but we will um, be, the students are required to pro provide documentation to our office in order to receive accommodations at the college level and they should be uh, regarded as having such an impairment. This is going to be f right out of the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act um, of 2008. Uh, next, uh, just the, the, this, the law that is going to cover students at the college level. So at the high school level, there's going to be something called IDEA. That's going to cover students K through 12 versus Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that's going to cover students at our, the college level. So the, the exact statement is no other qualified individual with disability in the United States uh, is, shall solely be by reason of his or her disability be excluded from the participation, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity conducted by any executive agency. So we cannot, even, even down to the admissions process. So something that we recently did in the last few semesters was SUNY um, no longer has the um, interest in special services on the application. It used to be on there. The students used to be able to check that off and say, I'm interested. However, that was deemed um, potentially discriminatory due to the fact that the admissions process could be based on that. Not that they were doing it that way, but if the student checked it off, then are they making the decision based on the fact that this person has a disability and may not be able to get through college? Um, and then Section 504 states that this should be achieved with reasonable accommodations, which is going to be the core of what we discussed today, is what exactly is a reasonable accommodation at the, at the college level. So some of the accommodations, most of you will be familiar with, with, with these. So one that generally most students that get through the Disability Services Office is going to be extended time. Extended time is typically time and a half. Depending on the student's functioning level, cognitive level, it may be increased to double time as needed. Um, for alternate testing environment on Eastern Campus, so I'll speak to a lot of Eastern Campus specific information today. Um, our Eastern Campus uh, the, is our Academic Skills Center, which is on the second floor of our library, for those of you who may not know already, that's um, MLRC 224. Um, so, they, and I'll also have f further into this PowerPoint the contact information of the staff of the Skill Center of who you would contact to provide the test to the Skill Center if the student wanted to use any of their testing accommodations. Um, note taking services not always provide to every student, but something that some students do benefit from. Maybe if they have something like ADHD and have a concentration issue or even a learning processing delay issue um, where they may not be able to keep up with the, the pace of the lecture. Um, Textbooks in alternate format, Disability Services typically takes care of that, so a student would provide us with an alternate text request, and then we will process that with the, um, with the publisher. The publisher has to give us permissions to give them the audio format, so that we would typically get a PDF from the publisher and then provide the student with free reading software resources um, so they can be able to get the audio book access. Um, some publishers take a little longer than others, so we do typically ask for the students to provide this information to us at least two to three weeks before the semester begins. Sometimes that doesn't always happen, though. Um, readers and scribes, so those are going to be a little bit of two different things. The readers, the reading software, we do not have human readers on any of our campuses. Um, the reading software is going to be what we typically use as our Kurzweil system, and that would be offered in the testing center. So they wouldn't, they, this is something that they would have to go to the alternate location to receive because we don't have that software available in the classrooms. Um, for scribes, scribes, I will go over this further in, you know, d into the other slides, but scribes are going to be more so utilized for um, 
students that may have more physical impairments that can't physically write, typically will go to the note-taking service first, and then if they absolutely need it, depending on their, their disability, um, we, we would dis discuss this, the scribe. Um, tape recorders and live scribe pens. Live scribe pens also record. Um, they, they record while the student writes, and then the student actually can download what they wrote down and click on the area and can hear what the professor was saying at the time of what they were writing. So live scribe pens are, I think, super cool, but then again, I'm a little biased. Um, <laughs> and they're just, uh, they're another tool that students can use. We do, depending on our availability, have both as a resource to, to borrow out, you know, that students can borrow out from our offices with the hope that they'll return them. <laughs> so um, sign language interpreters, those are gonna be for um, our, hear, our, our hearing impaired students. Um, so those uh, also are gonna be set up through, typically our, our central um, disabilities office. So J Jennifer Forney, our director, um, does, is, is um, going to uh, help students get connected with those resources. Um, also transcribing services like our CART services will also go through um, our, our central disabilities office. Um, furniture, um, assistive, uh, assistive listening devices and um, furniture are just some other examples of accommodations that we would need. So in the case of something like this room, um, thank you Harry for being here, <laughs> you could use Harry as an example. This room is, is pretty much accessible um, to somebody that would be in, in, in a wheelchair, but there are some of our some of our classrooms that are not unfortunately are not accessible so some of our rooms will have those um, f those the desks that are connected to the chair there's no there's no mobility to that that will not work for a student with any mobility impairment we will need an adjustable table with a, a stationary chair to assist them or if they're in a wheelchair you would have that adjustable table to move it out of the way to get them to get, be able to ex access that so we work every semester on making sure the campus is as, as accessible as possible obviously we're not going to catch everything um, so that's why you guys I feel like are our front lines when it comes to that if anything comes up just you know communication is key you always want to just reach out to disability services office if anything comes up if you see something um, some students have even reached out if they see something like a the um, one of the auto the automatic door opening buttons are not working on one of the buildings that's also very important too because um, you know if that doesn't work then we're talking about people getting stuck outside or we've had students in prior stuck in a bathroom so we want to make sure everything is, ac is ac as accessible as possible. So what was the, the main core of why we're here is reasonable accommodation so this defines it a little bit so you're going to make existing facilities accessible to um, and usable which was kind of what I alluded to just before. Um, altering non-essential functions and restructuring provision of assistive technologies and services and then determined it's and this is very important everything in disability services is on a case-by-case -case basis. It's unfortunately very gray. So we, we're here to help you kind of figure it out. Um, it's going to be based on the, the course, um, the d d degree program, depending on what the accommodation that they're, that they're looking for. So with, um, with not, you know, altering non-essential functioning, that is very important on the faculty perspective because we really do, they do take an educational viewpoint when it comes to reasonable accommodations as far as what are essential functions of the course and we want to make sure we're not fundamentally altering them. Um, and, and some, just to give you some examples um, of, of accommodations that may not be reasonable, um, some things that are included is if, it, um, it's, if, if it's a threat to the health and safety of, um, of others. Um, if they, uh, if it does make a substantial change to, to the essential curriculum, um, if it substantially alters the manner in which you provide the service, and then if it poses an undue financial or administrative burden. The thing about the last one that I said, the first three are going to be probably the most important because based on the last one, um, I had taken a disability law class last semester. The, um, that one, uh, in 35 plus years of case law, um, and findings under the f Section 504, both public and private, the federal government has never allowed an institution of higher education to refuse to provide auxiliary, auxiliary aids based on undue financial or administrative burden. Because the federal government is not going to take into consideration what just East Campus or this, you know, they're, they're taking into 
Suffolk County Community College, <laughs> what is your budget? They're, they're, you know, more than likely, that's, that's not something that we're gonna end up being able to get, get approved. But really what we're looking at, mostly from a faculty perspective is, how much is it, how much is it altering the, um, the essential functions of, of the programming? Um, just some examples. Um, with the, with the, th the threat to um, someone else. So just to give an example, um, it, the, so the individual would have, has a right to choose to assume the risk um, to self in the same way that anyone else has to assume the risk. So this gives an example of a blind individual could choose and can't be denied part participation in a hiking class that covers rough terrain because of fear that he, might, he or she might trip or fall. Um, but they may be denied participation in um, a scuba diving class which involves pairs and partners and then they may be, the other person's safety may be at risk because of they not be able to visually view the gauges and, and, and valves and things like that. So it actually, rather than self, it's more so this harm to other people, even though there is a genuine human concern for somebody that have visual impairments being in a you know a hiking situation they do have what they call i mean any any we all have the right to make choices and we kind of call it dis dignity of risk which is you give them the choice to make human decisions and and they may f fall literally or figuratively and and that's you know and that and we we need to allow them that chance to to learn um, as far as, as essential change to the curriculum, so just to give you a, a comparison, an institution may logically decide to, um, that asking them to make a substitution for basic math coursework for a business major is not reasonable. Not only is it appropriate to assure that anyone graduating with a business degree has some basic competency in math, but the skills mastered in that basic coursework will serve as the underpinning for much of the advanced coursework in the field versus an institution may not logically decide that it's not reasonable to make a substitution for a math course that is the only math requirement, three hours in a 150 hour course sequence for an early childhood major. This three hour requirement is neither a substantial part of the curriculum nor essential to the course of study. So it's, we really have to take things as far as that essential component very, very case by case. And that's really the theme that's gonna go on here. Um, some other examples, um, <clears throat> the, in, as far as the substantial alteration in the manner in which uh, you provide the service, um, an institution doesn't have to have a distance learning um, program for if, if one student's coming in, if they don't have it for everybody else. So we don't have to create a program uh, college-wide for one, for one student. Um, so the, what's important here is that we're, Whereas K through, K through 12's focus is success. So a student may age out to 21, um, but they're gonna provide every accommodation, every service they need in order to be successful and get that local diploma, or whatever diploma, even if it was a, a CDOS credential, um, which is uh, career, development, uh, career Development Occupational Studies, that's gonna be a credential that they would get that's um, what would have been the former IEP diploma. So whatever they're looking for their educational goal, that's success, they're gonna provide everything they need. Whereas college is equal access. We're leveling the playing field for them. So we provide the supports, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to alter things completely in order to get them to where they need to be. We have to make sure it's reasonable for the environment, the, the, the environment that they're in. Okay. <clears throat> so some did you know, so um, some of this we already went over, but um, all students who register with the Disability Services Office um, must provide comprehensive disability documentation in order to receive accommodations. Um, counselors review the documentation. We, uh, we, like I said, case by case basis. Um, doesn't mean because somebody with the same diagnosis, they're gonna get the same accommodations. It's all based on our evaluation of, um, typically it's either their, their IEP and their psychoeducational or maybe a medical, if they didn't have an IEP, it would be more so a 504 or some other f further medical documentation to make that assessment. Um, all requests must be reviewed, even if they fundamentally alter the, the course content. So we have to show that we are engaging in the interactive process. So we can't just say no. With any accommodation, even if we think it sounds you know, it's completely out of the box, we have to at least show the process of trying. Because if OCR were ever to come down and ask, 
why you know, the, the student has complained about you know, so-and-so, we have to have a paper trail of, well, this is, these are the things that we did and these are the discussions that we had, and this is what we came up with as, as reasonable. And more, than, more times than not, OCR, um, if, it, if it's from based on the educational viewpoint and we show that we've, we've made, taken those steps, they typically will provide some sort of recommendations, but we'll understand the, the, the college's viewpoint on why we did so. But we always want to make sure we're taking the steps for the student to, even if, it, if, even if the eventual answer is going to be no, or the request is going to be denied, that we, that we did make those, those um, efforts. Um, generally, students don't need to redo their accommodation sheet. So one question that I get sometimes from professors is on their laminated form, the issue date is, you know, some students are here for 10 semesters, so for, let's say from fall 2010. Um, the accommodations never expire once they have them here. Um, doesn't mean once they transfer to another institution that they won't need to get new documentation, but that we'll, we'll review with them when they're about to transfer. Um, but something to always consider is we're not renewing these every semester, so even if, if, if we're spring 19 and you're seeing something from fall 17, they're still going to be active accommodations and they're transferable on all three campuses. So um, if you, you know, that they, they wouldn't need to, you know, if they were to come from, if you happen to know they're an Ameren campus student and they came here, it's okay for them just to use the same form that they used at the Selden campus. Um, <clears throat> Students meet with the disability counselor to, to uh, review the approved accommodations, um, and then we also review the process of using the accommodation. So once again, student initiated. The student would have to show the professor, and on the next slide, um, most of you are familiar with it, I also have a sample. Um, they would have to show the professor the laminated letter in order to get the accommodations. Um, the student, and that's exactly that last part. So student presents the laminated letter f um, f to, the, to the professor. Um, in order to utilize any of those accommodations. And they're encouraged to, to give that letter in the first, at least, we say first one to two weeks. We're hoping that first week, um, because accommodations cannot be retroactive. So if they're showing you at midterm and said, hey, how about that test in the first week, we wouldn't have them retest. So because it is up to them, the timing of their accommodation. So they should be showing it, they're highly recommended to show it in that first week in order to get it for any quiz or test that may be going forward. So just always keep in mind, they're not retroactive. So if they, if they fail the test and then show it to you, that would be then for future for examinations. Um, it really is up to them to show it in a, in a, in a timely manner. And this is, this is the example of, of the, you know, the letter. This is more of a hard copy version of it. So this is what we would give to every student in their intake process. So they, if, if they tell you they have accommodations but don't provide the laminated letter, they should not be receiving accommodations until you show this. Because if they don't have this and they do have a disability, they, they should be going to the process of meeting with the Disability Services Office to go through the proper channels. So the, the, when in doubt, send them to us and have them contact us and then we will assess maybe they lost this we they just need a new one we could always we could always print that out for them um, but we can really be that channel to help you guys out and to figure out whether or not they they do they are documented with with our office um, all right so that's 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 the letter and once again this just re reiterates the fact that it's the student's responsibility to show the um, the professor uh, and this we're going to go through a quick breakdown of responsibilities, so student responsibilities, faculty responsibilities, and then um, the responsibilities of um, the testing center or the disability services office. So the reason why that is broken off a little bit is because each campus does their testing a little bit differently. So um, our Eastern and Grant run it similarly where we have a testing center um, in a different building, uh, whereas our Amherst campus runs their own testing center. So if you see some of the language um, up there, that's because we, um, on a, on a college-wide basis, we differ a little bit on how we run our, um, our testing center. So as far as the extended time, student must inform the professor um, of the intent to use the accommodation and then go to the testing center. So we always tell them. We also encourage them to try to do that with at least one week's notice to give the professor enough time to get that test over the testing center. You know, if you ask the day before, or I've had some students call my office and on the, on an hour before the class starts to say, I need, I need my accommodations for this test, and then I go through the process of did you set it up, did you call? So it's very important to have 
that advance notice for even the skill center to contact the professor if they don't, don't receive the, um, the test in time. Um, the, so typically, as far as the timing of the test, typically the rule of thumb would be that they would take the test, even if it was at the separate location, at the same date and time as everybody else. However, that will, the, the, where there would be an issue with that is if they have a scheduling conflict. So say they have an 8 to 9.15 and a 9.30 to 10.45. If they even have time and a half, we, we never want them late to that next class because the next professor is not going to, may not be very forgiving to have that student late all the time when they're testing. So that's where we would typically flex the time of day that they're taking it. We like to try to recommend the students stick with the day, the same day, but we may have to flex the time of day just to accommodate for the fact that they have, they may have a back to back schedule. Um, as far as faculty responsibilities, uh, so the faculty will pro provide the quiz or exam to the testing center and this is just, I provided the contact information for our testing center. So it's going to be Melanie Mooney and Courtney Foley. Uh, so their extension is two five, the 2594 and then those are their email addresses if you wanted to just scan and email it rather than physically walking it over. Um, and then the faculty would pick up the exam at the skill center or the, you, know, you would speak to the skill center whether or not you're okay with it being scanned and faxed and emailed back. Um, and then the uh, and then grades and and the disseminates the exam and the grades all together. So you don't want to necessarily single out the student. So everybody else got their their grades back, and then in the middle of class, you're like, and you. <laughs> so um, we want to make it as as equal as possible. Um, and as far as our testing center, we um, administer the exams with the same permissions as in the classroom. So we're gonna we're gonna base it on what you as the professor says. You're, you know, so some students do come in and say, oh, my professor said it was open book. But we're going to make sure <laughs> before we provide that open book that the professor has said so. So we have started on the Eastern Campus. What uh, the other two campuses have already um, had for some time is a, like, uh, is a, testing, uh, a testing form that they would fill out, uh, that the professor would fill out just to indicate, will it be open book? How long are you really providing the students? Um, because sometimes quizzes, you're not providing an hour and 15 minutes for a quiz, you're providing 15 minutes. So if they, you know, if, if, they have, if they have double time, they should only be in there for 30 minutes. They shouldn't be in there for the hour. So we're really trying to, as much as possible, provide the same amount of time um, for what they would give in the classroom and then just either do that by time and a half or double it, not give them quadruple time. <laughs> and then um, the, the ensuring, it to have obviously, the acad academic integrity of the exams, we want to make sure, obviously, that you know, the student's not delivering the exam in any way so they don't have access to that information and everything's sealed and closed and locked up um, once the exam is completed. And college-wide, um, just a little bit of a statistic, so we had over 6,000 exams administered in the 17-18 school year. So we do have a lot of students coming in and out. Um, of our testing centers, so I'm very thankful <laughs> for our testing center being helpful in that in that manner. Um, but there's there's always a constant a constant flow, and uh, once again, just a constant communication between the professor and and honestly, the, the the initiation would be from the student. So you won't know if they they need that accommodation unless they're telling you. So most of this is going to be. A, you'll see is going to be a student initiated process and then what your responsibilities are once the student makes that first takes that first step. Um, so communication, so sign language interpreters, the CART services, the CART services is going to be the transcribing services. So student would have either a laptop or an iPad. Um, transcriber could be in the back of the room and then student would be reading in real time what you're saying because the transcriber is typing it up and whatever um, whatever the student is using um, to read it, that's, that's what it would come up as. So the student's responsibilities is with their, they would provide us with a copy of their course schedule and any, update, and any updates to their schedule so we know where they are. Um, and then also, you, you wanna inform dis they want to inform disability services of any additional needs for clubs and events. So you know, some students, it may, they, they may need it for, um, they, we had one student uh, recently that had to go on a field trip. Um, and t they needed for that field trip uh, an interpreter. And it was a requirement for them to go on the field trip for their class. So we contacted the interpreting service and they were, went and met the student in New York City. 
and, uh, and was with, with her during the time to help her interpret um, everything that was going, going on because there was a class assignment connected to the field trip. So she had to have that equal access. Um, faculty responsibilities allow some flexibility for seating. So you know, if, if they have you know, the interpreter, obviously maybe an extra seat in the classroom, the uh, cart service person may need the extra seat. Uh, typically, we do put in um, a request to maintenance for extra chairs in the classroom as much as we can, depending on capacity, um, to help with that also. And, um, and, and request assistance, if, if that additional chair isn't there, you could always request it through our office. Um, our, our responsibility, we're gonna email out to faculty just prior to the semester just to make you aware that there'll be an interpreter or a card service provider in the classroom. And then also, um, we make the request, we request the contract of vendors to provide services to, to the students. Um, so that typically, like I said, Jen Forney is, is who does um, most of the handling of our interpreter and, and card service um, um, provisions. And the um, closed captioning, that one is tricky. I know we're trying to make our, uh, most of our classrooms you know, ADA compliant, which would include if you have any audio you know, or, or if you have any video for it to be either transcribed and the transcription be posted onto Blackboard, or if, if, if the video, if you could have the video or if it already has closed captioning, great, but it would, has to be, would have to be captioned um, if it hasn't already done so. But I've had a few professors that already have the transcription, if it's their own audio, and as long as that's on there, that will also serve its purpose also. Um, FM system, we're not gonna see a lot of those, um, but FM system is gonna be a system where the student is wearing um, an attachment on their ear, professor's wearing a mic, almost similar to the one that I'm wearing today, um, and it amplifies the, what they can hear the professor saying. So that's what an FM system um, is. We have some older FM systems, um, hoping to get some updated ones, but that's what the FM system is. It's gonna be more of a professor wearing a mic and then the, the student's gonna have the other piece on their ear to hear the, the professor speaking. All right, so um, electronic readers uh, and in large format. So the student must inform the professor of the intent to use um, the reader in the separate location. So that's, once again, start to stu student initiated. Um, and once again, if they're gonna use, as they would use the extra time, if they're gonna use the reader, they wanna, you know, the, you wanna do this at least one week in advance for that process. Um, and because also with the reader, we only have a certain amount of computers uh, in our testing center, so we wanna make sure it's accessible to the student and we're scheduling them at the right time so they have that accessibility. Um, student and takes the exam, so this is the same thing as before that's, that we discussed, is that this is typically gonna be the same date and time as everybody else, unless we have to make accommodations for, like I said, the software and or the time of day due to a scheduling conflict if they have back-to-back -back schedules. Um, so you, same thing, so this faculty is gonna provide it to the, the testing center, the faculty is gonna pick up the exam, and then the enlarged print, I like to try as much as possible when I can catch it to send out an email prior to the beginning of the semester to make professors aware that the there's a student with a visual impairment in your classroom that may require um, enlarged print for handouts or assignments. Once again, if things are more digital, it makes things more accessible. So if it's on Blackboard already, they, and it's on Word documents, the student can go in, or if they have their laptop with them, they can go in and enlarge it themselves. But if we're, doing a handout, physical handout, that's not accessible on Blackboard or any other digital format, then, we're, then that is something that would have to be enlarged in order to make it as accessible as possible for our visually impaired students. Um, disability, our testing center, disability services, um, we would convert the, uh, the test um, to make it enlarged. So we have something called Zoom Text, which would allow for the test to be enlarged on the screen for them to be able to, to read it. And then they, the testing center does that by scanning it in into the electronic format and then that allows the software to read it. Okay, um, I'm sorry this is a little off of the screen, but most of you should be familiar with this. So if a student is in Math 001, if they're in the first developmental course, we do have a calculator policy where even if they have use of a calculator as an accommodation, there are certain sections of Math 001 that they um, college-wide policy should be doing them without the calculator. So for whole numbers, decimals, and real number systems, we always have the conversation on the, upon intake, especially if the student is in Math 001, that 
the, they are going to be asked to, n to not use the accommodation of the calculator, and that is, that is okay because it's been deemed that they should be at the point of being able to do these computations prior to once they get to the college level. The, when, you, when they get to ratio and proportion, percentage and geometry, the latter half of 001 is when they can start using the calculator again. If the student's in 007 or above, we don't have to have this conversation. But this is really, it. this is their policy that was a college-wide policy set. Um, goes along with, and it's in compliance with ADA standards, because um, this really shows that we really have to meet, like I said, what's reasonable. So the reasonable part of it is that the, the, they're gauging that the student should be able to do those computations and may not be able to do those without the calculator. So that's where we kind of came to um, an, an agreement between ADA and the, coll the college-wide. Um, if students ever had a question about that, you could, once again, when in doubt, send, it, send, them, send them our way. Okay. Um, Note-taking accommodation. So th the student must request the accommodation um, from the professor. And then we have carbon copy in, the, uh, in, in every office as far as you know, college-wide. So some students like to use that. And basically, the, if, if the, student would the, professor, if the professor were to elect a student to make a copy of their notes, the student could, the note-taking student could write it on the carbon copy and then easily just tear off the bottom part and, and hand it over. However, if you have lecture notes already on Blackboard, that could serve as the purpose of the note-taking accommodation. So what we tell the students is it's either the professor, professor initiated with the, them providing their own notes, or it, they would choose a um, student in the classroom to provide their notes. The one thing about student volunteers, it sometimes gets a little hard to find those volunteers. Um, some, some, some ways of doing that is just letting them know it's a good resume builder. Um, some professors, depending on the situation, have um, provided extra credit for being a note taker. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're trying to not um, out, let's say, the students. So we want to try to not have them part of the process. It really is profession, professor initiated. And then um, we would review the process with the student at the in, in the intake. And then also um, the, uh, the determine an, an, an alternate if note taking is not appropriate. So some students do better as visual learners, some do better as auditory. So some students may not like note taker, they may prefer tape recording, um, which is something else we would discuss um, as far as the accommodations go, because that's also another very important um, accommodation that based on law, we would have to provide to, um, to our students. And that's where, there we go. So um, one big thing about the recording devices, and this will go for e laptops too, which we would discuss, the, the recording devices shouldn't be used for anything else but recording the class. So, you know, they shouldn't be, like this says, listening to music all, all, um, off of it, any so for anything for social media, because d depending on what they're using. Some professors will allow them to use a phone or an iP iPod, iPad, iPod, I feel like I'm so archaic, but, <laughs> um, but it really is, we make them know, make it known when they get the tape recording accommodation that they should be using for the sole purpose of the content of the course um, and also not to share it with anybody else. It should only be for themselves. Um, and then the, uh, the, but for the tape recording accommodation, same thing, it should be a listed accommodation on that laminated form. Um, if, if you want them to follow up with us, you should. <laughs> if you have any questions, if you're like, it's not on here, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, if you, if you let all of your students tape record already, they may not have to come to us. But if you don't have all your students tape recording, then they would have to come to us if they don't already have it as an accommodation. Um, and we also typically, um, we do also typically tell the students that they should um, discard of the digital recording by the end of the semester. I've had some professors say, oh, but they may need it for the next section of courses. So then it, you know, we could have that conversation with the professor if they're OK with them keeping that content. But typical rule of thumb is we're asking them to um, erase the information by the end of the semester. Um, so faculty responsibilities allowing them to record the class. And then um, so th some, some students may request the use of cell phones. It's OK to not allow it. because. We can, like I said, we can have them borrow out a tape recorder or give them alternate methods on how to, to record, depending on your comfortability level on the use of cell phones in the classroom. Uh, and then we always review the procedures and the responsibilities of the student, because that, that when you're starting to lose it, use electronics in the classroom, 
that you have more responsibility with not using it for alternate purposes. So that's also very important. Okay. So um, use of a scribe, you're not going to see this as much, but like I said, it's going to be a little bit um, more of an up, you know, a higher level than uh, the note taker, where the 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 student will register with us. Um, provide they're going to provide an updated schedule because we need to f the scribe is going to be the, the you know the the student's right hand so they're going to be in there you know in every class to write down wh whatever the student needs to be written down even outside of notes so like they could get a copy of the notes from the professor but they may be doing a written assignment that's when they would come in to have to write down what the student needs um, so like math classes things like that a scribe would be very important because you're doing a lot of that writing. Um, then that's where that comes in, provide scribe, um, and then you there the student will provide the scribe with the, the note, the notebook and the pen. Um, so if, if they don't, obviously we can help with that, but um, those are just some of the responsibilities. Um, be, uh, the faculty responsibilities, uh, typically it's the scribes are hired, whereas the note takers are volunteers, the scribes are hired. So they are an employee of the college. Um, and it's that therefore, you know, just when, when they were, if they're approved for a scribe, there's a reason why they're approved. Um, we would hire and train the scribes, interview the scribes in the process, um, and then um, re review the scribe schedule and pairs the scribes with the students. So the, some scribes and the scribes that want to be the scribes are m some of our students that are full-time students themselves. So we go through the process of trying to figure out how do you get a full-time student to provide scribe <laughs> services for a full-time student. So it's really just, we're really just trying to figure that out and, and trying to match them with somebody that it's not overwhelming the scribe, but it's also helpful to the student. Um, and then the, um, the, you know, arriving in class on time, those are some of the scribe responsibilities that would be part of the um, process. All right. So aides in the classroom. This is a big one. Um, aides are typically only uh, the only recommended for medical reasons. Doesn't mean that we won't take into consideration other other pieces of that. But typically, if you see an aide on campus, most are provided for medical reasons if they're in, with, within the classroom. Um, student would still have to register with the office. And the student has to provide their own aid. We don't provide aids for the students. They would, receive, they would use an outside resource in order to, um, to, to, to get the aid. Um, typically for students that may have um, more learning difficulties that need the aid, typically you'll see them more in transition. So like bus to classroom, 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 maybe during tutoring pieces. If you have any questions as to why there's that extra person in the classroom, you, once again, reach, reach out to us because um, aides also are an accommodation process and we would have to um, provide them with their responsibilities on campus because we've had some difficulty, not all the time, but with the aide potentially being a disruption themselves in the classroom, um, which is not the purpose of that. And if that becomes an issue, we, we would need to address it and bring the aide and the student back in because typically um, the student and the aide would, would come into us in the beginning and we're going to go over with them their roles and responsibilities um, in, in the physical classroom just so they're aware of, of not, ho hopefully not being a, a disturbance, but also that the aide is not answering questions for the student. They're, you know, they're, they're not doing, the if they're in more of a physical setting, they're not do doing the actual physical work for them. Um, so that is a very big component of it. And they may need to come back in to relearn the process. And that's absolutely fine. That's what we're here for. All right. Um, laptop for note taking, very similar to a tape recorder. If they use the laptop for note taking, they, um, they they're also being told that they should not be using the laptop to go on any other, any other website or things like that. And if they do, that's another big thing about accommodations. If you find that they are using it for an alternate reason that has nothing to do with the accommodation, um, they can potentially be at risk of losing the accommodation. And, and we would have to talk to them about that process. They may no longer be permitted to use it in the classroom if you find they're on Facebook for the hour and 15 minutes and not using it for the note taking or the written component of the class. So um, you know they, they can be asked to put it away if you're finding that they're not using it for the right reasons. And then you would always contact us and we once again can bring them in and talk to them about what you should be using it for. We always talk to them about that <laughs> in that first meeting. But sometimes if you know we get, can, could get a little bit lost in translation with that. All right. 
Um, medical concerns. So the biggest thing with medical concerns is going to be um, what we find if students have more chronic issues, so arthritis, lupus, um, anything where that could flare up or, you know, that, that may not necessarily be a consistent issue, um, you may see an increase in absences. So one of the things that comes with this is potentially considering some sort of attendance leniency. However, once again, we have to assess what's reasonable for the classroom. What's reasonable for one classroom might not be reasonable for another. So like we have had professors in the past, some are good with, some are flexible to three and some are flexible to eight, but it's all dependent on, what the, on, the, on the professor's discretion. We're not gonna blanket any of these out because that's not appropriate for depending on, especially if we're talking about, let's say we're talking about the sciences where they're missing labs and things like that. You know, you're missing, if you're missing eight classes, you're missing four laps. <laughs> That's, you know, there's, there may not be any way to catch up with that and, and get back into the groove. So in, in that situation, if a student's out for eight, we may have to start discussing the, the conversation, have the conversation of possibly medical withdrawal for the semester. Maybe we need to start this back up when, when you, you know, you're feeling better, you know, feeling well. Um, but something to consider. Um, also breaks. They may need breaks um, during the classroom um, instruction. And even with the breaks, they're told that they need to catch up on what they may have missed during those breaks. But with those, those students that have medical concerns, you may see that a little bit more. You may even see it listed on their accommodations letter. This is breaks during classroom instruction or even breaks um, during testing. We typically try to say not to exceed 15 minutes per hour because once you see that, I mean, even 15 minutes sounds like a lot, um, but even anything beyond that seems you, you're basically missing half, you know, almost half the, half the class at that point. So we use some, like I said, um, gauges on time, but then you know, we can always discuss what works best for, for the classroom. Um, and there's one, uh, one other thing, the um, accessible the desks and chairs. We're, I mean, the, the, the student will let us know, make us aware of their mobility impairment and what they would need. We would contact the, um, you know, maintenance if it's needed. And then if you see that in your classroom, just don't, the major responsibility is just don't, don't, don't remove it. Or we would have some, um, we've had some experiences with magical, you know, musical chairs or magical chairs <laughs> where they end up in a different classroom or so, um, you know, ultimately the responsibility to the professor is, um, don't use it as a personal desk. You know, some of these seem obvious, but you know, some some th these are here based on you know prior prior experiences. Um, and then we put the, the request in for the the furniture in the classroom. All right. So biggest part of this communication. So you want to contact us. So this, like I said, we we broke it down a bit to what reasonable accommodations are. Um, you know, each, uh, all of our responsibilities in the accommodations process, but when in doubt, call us. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest part of this. Um, if you can't get us, this gives you everyone. <laughs> um, you know, Jen Forney is always accessible and she's a, she's a great resource also. So, um, but thank you guys very much for being part of this um, and I appreciate you being part of the process.